We're living in a time that is very different from the time our parents lived and our grandparents lived. To say the least, it's very strange. And the challenges that our children face day in and day out are different than the challenges that we face as we grew up in this country. The Americas of the 80s and 90s is not the Americas of today. Things have changed. And our children growing up, they are coming up with challenges that we really didn't have to deal with. And it wasn't part of this society or any society. But what do we do at this time in order to equip our children growing up to make sure that they have their identity as a Muslim? That they grow up as a Muslim, they live in Islam, and they die in Islam. There are three things that I feel like it's essential in our time to remind ourselves and also to teach our children. And if you do these three things, I think that they will be equipped to go through the valleys of life, the roads of life, the ups and downs of life, and they will still be okay, inshallah ta'ala. The first thing is to tell them about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tell them about Allah, the reality of God. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. That there's no power or strength or momentum power except that which comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fa'alun lima yurid. Allah can do whatever He wants. Tabaraka alladhi bi yadihi al mulk wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir. Blessed is he who has the entire dominion in his hand and he has power over all things. We have to make sure that our children know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so they feel they have tawakkul to our Lord that he can do whatever he wants and they never feel alone. When they have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they have everything. They have everything. That's what we need to start teaching our children about the reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And teach, him, teach them basic aqidah from a young age. From a young age that we, our children need to know. This is how many of the young people, Muslims and people of other faith, they lose their religion because they say, oh, if God is all powerful and if God is all good, then why do you have the tsunami? Right? That's not our religion. That's not our aqidah. We believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manifests himself in two ways. With jalal and jamal. With majesty and beauty. So when we see a waterfall, what do we say? Subhanallah. Because it's so beautiful. And when we see a tsunami, what do we say? We say subhanallah. It's the majesty of God. Allah is doing that. It is Allah that is beyond. He is the one who is every fi'l, every action that happens. It is Allah behind that. So our children need to know that that connection they have to have, that it is Allah. So when they are alone, they know that Allah is with them. Sidi Bahlul said, فَعْلَمْ بِأَنَّ اللَّهِ حَاضِرْ فِي كُلِّ مَكَانٍ He said, you should know with certainty, with haqqul yaqeen, that wherever you go, Allah is with you. In a book called Children's Letter to God, one of the children who's five years old wrote a letter to God. It says, dear God, ever since I found you, I never felt alone again. I never felt alone again. And that is that connection. We have to make this relationship of Allah with our children real. And the best way to do it is through prayer. Because five times a day, we connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But how do we connect? How is our, how is our prayer just motion? Or we can go beyond motion to see the meaning of the prayer. As salah imadu deen, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that prayer is the central pillar of this religion. This is what's holding everything together. It's the prayer. As-salam mi'rajul mu'min. It is your mi'raj. It is your spiritually, you will go to a place where no one can go. Because you enter another realm, another reality, another zone. The moment you say Allahu Akbar, you enter into the prayer. Teach them the reality of the prayer. Teach them the, not a prayer of, you know, they, they went to Mawlana Jalaluddin al-Rumi. And they said, how is it that when you pray, we just... Just by looking at your prayer, we are just mesmerized. And then when we pray, it's different. 
یعنی سید ما در نماز سجده به دیدار میبریم بیچاره اون که سجده به دیوار میبرد he said when I pray I pray towards the beatific vision of God how devastated to these bicharas these poor people who pray towards walls pray towards we have to teach our children the, the, the taste of worship because everything in life has a taste just like food has taste friendship has taste religion has taste worship has taste It has a taste. And this is why it is important. Iqbal said, Sajdai ishq ho to ibadat me maza'ata hai. He said, if you do your sajda with ishq, with love, it is then and only then that you can taste the sweetness of your worship. That's the only time you can taste the sweetness of your worship. Teach them proper prayer beyond motions that they're standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then when they go to sajda there's a cosmic shift that happens every time we go to sajda Allah removes everything between a servant and himself there's nothing between us when we are in sajda and we say subhanahu wa ta'ala you are the most high are we lying in that moment are we lying is he the most high Khaj Abdullah Al-Ansari, the great sage of 5th century said, he said one of the great lie that Muslims say is when they go to the prayer and say Allahu Akbar to enter. He said, is God greater than everything else in that moment? If it is, then you have the right prayer. If it is, then you have the right prayer because prayer by its nature, inna salata tanha anil fahshahi wal munkar, by the nature of prayer, it should prevent you from fahsha and from munkar. It should prevent you from evil action. If it should prevent you from doing anything wrong, this is the need. This is why it's five times a day just to reorient yourself towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but not physically. Physically, mentally, and spiritually. And this is important that when we are in the prayer, we teach our children from a young age that you're in standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sayyidina Ali, when he used to go to the prayer, he used to shiver. They said, why are you shivering? He said, I'm standing in front of Allah. Shouldn't I shiver? This is the maqam of the prayer. But for us, it became just an act, an act of physical act, right? Well, they, they, one of the Urdu poets said, he said, Safi kaj dil puraishan sajda bi zawq ki jazbi andarun baqi nahi hai. He said, your, your lines are all crooked in a masjid and there is no love, there's no burning love, desire in your heart. Why? Because there, there's, there's no love, there's no burning, there's no fire in your heart. That's the reason that you are depressed. That's why the reason you're in prayer and you're scattered, you're everywhere. People go around the globe when they pray and when they say, Salaam Alaikum wa Rahmatullah, they come back. Why? Why are we so scattered? Why are we so scattered? Because the prayer, we don't know the meaning of the prayer. We don't know who we are standing in front. This is the relationship. This is how you connect people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through salah, through prayer. And those children, when they grow up, if they have that connection, you will see wonders in their life. You will see wonders in their life. The second thing is that we should remind ourselves and teach our children about the love of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Make them fall in love with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Tell them stories from a young age. Sheikh Muhammad Al-Yaqubi Hafizullah, the great Syrian scholar said, to love him is to know him. You have to know this man in order to fall in love with him. And everyone in the history of Islam, whether they were Muslim, they were Jews, they were Christian, they loved him and they respected him if they studied his life and if they were fair. Everyone. So teach them about the Prophet Wasallam. Why should we love him? Why should we love him? Because Allah loves him. Because Allah took him at his Habib. The Sahabas were sitting one day And they were talking. And one said, oh, mashallah, look at Isa alayhi salam, the maqam of Jesus, right? Masihullah. Look at Isa, ruhullah. What a maqam. Look at Musa alayhi salam, kalimullah. Allah spoke to Musa. The other one says, ma, look at the maqam of Ibrahim, khalilullah. He is the friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam was coming from the back and as he curved, he heard their conversation and he smiled and he said, wa ana habibullah. And I'm the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what a beloved is, a Khalil is not. A Kalim is not. A Masih is not. This is the highest level to be the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every Sahaba loved him. Why? Because of his 
His beauty was unlike any other beauty. His beauty was unlike any other beauty. His akhlaq was at a level that the Quran says, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلِقٍ عَظِيمٍ You are on a vast character. You're his character. He, every moral virtue, every moral virtue he was a master of. He has mastered every moral virtue. And that's why all of the Sahaba loved him. All of them, they were in love with him. Every single one of them. Every single one. Because of his akhlaq, his character. I was only sent to perfect noble character. How does one perfect noble character? Can somebody teach black belt jujitsu if they don't have a mastery in jujitsu and they haven't got their black belt already? No. You have to be at a level of perfection in order to teach that. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa character was perfect sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, what the, and he loved the Sahaba. This is one thing that people forget. The Sahaba loved him, but he loved the Sahaba. And he noticed. He noticed everything just like the Sahaba noticed when Sayyidina Abu Bakr looked at him and he saw the gray hair. He counted the gray hair. And he said, oh, you have this many gray hair on, on your beard. This is ish. This is love. Pay attention to the detail. But he noticed as well. He noticed Thoban. He noticed Thoban, one of the Sahaba, that he was losing weight, that he looked really sleep deprived. And he went to Thoban when they called him. He said, Yeah, Thoban, come. What is wrong? Why are you losing weight? And you know what he said? He said, Wallahi, uh, every time I want to eat food, I think about you and I run to the masjid to see your face. When I see you, I forget about food and drink. And the Prophet ﷺ smiled. This is love. These are lovers of the Prophet ﷺ. Then the Prophet said, why, why are you sleep deprived? He said, at night, I can't go to sleep all night. I said, why you can't go to sleep? He said, because I miss you, Messenger of Allah. The greatest feeling you will ever have in your life is when you miss the messenger of Allah and you shed tears and somebody will ask you, why are you crying? You say, I just miss my messenger. That is the day that your heart comes to life with his love. So he says, Ya, Allah, ya Rasulullah, I miss you so much, but it's night. I can't come to the masjid. You are in your house to see you. So I stay up the whole night in the hope of dawn. So I can come to Fajr prayer and see your face. And the Prophet says, what else? You look very, you know, the, the face, one of the things that Raqab al-Isfahani said, he said, the face is an amazing thing. All your emotions shows in your face. If you get angry, it shows on your face. If you're sad, it shows in your face. If you're happy, you're smiling, it shows in your face. So the face shows, the Prophet ﷺ said, your faces are the binders of your deeds. Right? So your deeds will manifest in your face. And that's why you see the old awliya of Islam. If you look at the photos of old awliya of Islam, you will see how beautiful and radiant they are. And look at the old photos of actors and actresses, what happened to their faces. He said, I'm worried about Jannah. Who's worried about paradise? He said, because you're going to be in Jannah al Firdaus. What is going to be Thoban in paradise? Which corner of paradise I'll be? Would I see you in paradise? If I can't handle a night without seeing you, how am I going to handle life in paradise? I don't want paradise if I don't see you. Paradise, if you don't have Allah and his messenger in paradise, it's just a bunch of trees. It's just a bunch of trees. What makes paradise, paradise, to see the beatific vision of God and to be with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could answer, and this is, this is the heart of an ordinary sahaba who was around the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he had this yearning, and this real true love for his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah sends down Jibreel from Sidratul Muntaha to go down and gives the answer. The Prophet could not answer him. Allah didn't allow him to speak. He said, no, you answer him. 
and he sent out revelation. وَمَنْ يُتِعَ اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولَ فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهَ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصِّدِّقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ وَحَسُنَ أُولَٰئِكَ رَفِيقًا As for those who obey Allah and His message, that they will be with those whom Allah granted their favors on from amongst the prophets, amongst the truthful, amongst the martyrs, and amongst the righteous. And what a club to join. What a companionship to be part of. That verse, in, according to Wahidi's Asbab al Nuzul, came because of Thawban. Question in his yearning, in his love for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that you will be with them. You are al maru ma'man ahab. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, a person is with whom he loves. And uh, the ulama of hadith, they say this is the most hopeful hadith in all of hadith collection. This is the most hopeful hadith in all of the hadith collection. A person is with whom he or she loves. Who do you love the most? If you love the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you will be with him in the hereafter. Aqulu qawli hadha astaghfirullah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Salatu wa Salam ala Sayyid al-Mursaleen wa ala alim sahbihi ajmeen, barahmatik ya arhamur rahimeen. The third and last thing to teach our children and remind ourselves is the concept of Tawbah. It is extremely important that we put that in their hearts from a young age. That no matter what they do, they can always go to Allah and ask for forgiveness. And that only happens if we do the first two. The first is to have a relationship with Allah that they can go to Him. That this relationship is real. Don't teach the children about the concept of this, make, make God a, a concept in their mind. Something they cannot grasp. Make it real. Allah is our haq. Make it real for them. That they have a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then they can make tawbah and go back. Kullu ibn Adam khata'un. All of children of Adam will make mistakes. Every son and daughter of Adam makes mistakes. There's nobody on this planet that doesn't make mistakes. But the best of those who make mistakes are those who turn to Allah and make tawbah. Because you become, inna Allah yuhibbul tawabin wa yuhibbul mutatahirin. Allah loves those who make tawbah and those who purify themselves. Both are the same thing. One is inward, one is outward. The people who purify and make wudu and they're always in purity, they, they clean their outward. But, but toba is the ghusl of your, of your internal being, your heart. It gets purified. So turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَتُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا أَيُّهَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَفْرِحًا And turn to Allah and make toba. Toba means to turn. It's a, it's a wrong translation for repentance because repentance comes from a, from a, in terms that, that's from other tradition. But Tawbah, literally, it means to turn. Who do you turn to? Towards a tawab the one who is constantly turning towards you. That's why it's powerful. It is not because, oh, I made Tawbah and I turned to Allah. No, you turn towards al tawab and he turned, he turned that, that dirt that you are into a priceless gold. That's what he did. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will turn you into priceless gold if you turn to him. If you turn to him. But if you don't live in sinful lifestyle and most of these things happen because from a young age we don't teach our children you will make mistake. If you do, go to Allah. Ask for forgiveness. He will forgive you. Allah is forgiving. Tell them stories. They're, they're, if you look at the history of Islam, if you look at the history of Islam, there's a whole, there are books written on these people who were sinners and they were turned into saints. And one of them is Bishr al-Hafi. Bishr al-Hafi was an alcoholic and addict. There are people who are daim al-khamr. They're always drunk. And may Allah protect this community. May Allah protect our families and our friends from this. But those who are afflicted with addiction, please do not make fun of them. Please do not laugh at them because you don't know what they're going through. If addiction is real, people are addicted to their phone and they can't put it down. What do you think about the man who's addicted or a woman who's addicted to drugs and, and, and uh, heroin and crack and cooking? There are people who are addicted and we should help them and stay out of that. And the only way you can do it if you bring Allah at the center of your life. 
Even the Christian in the 12, 12 step program, it says, let go and let God. Let go. But you have to have God in order to get, to get out of that addiction. But you can get out of it. Mr. Harvey was an alcoholic and he was Daimul Khamar. He was always drunk. He was always drunk. But one day he was passing by. It rained. It was muddy. The road was muddy. And he saw a paper. And on the paper it says Bismillah Rahman Rahim in Arabic. And he passed and he saw the paper and mud was all over. And he wanted to walk over it. But he said, how could I walk over the name of God? This is a drunk Muslim. This is a drunk Muslim. He said, I can't walk over the name of God. So he went to pick it up. And this is why, what do the police do? The police wants you to walk on a straight line. And they put the hand on the nose and they do all this stuff. Why? Because people who are drunk, their hand-eye coordination is not one. It's not working, the hand-eye coordination. So he goes to pick it up and he falls in the mud and he can't pick it up. He gets back up and says, no, I should just walk over this and go home. And then he says, no, this is called dilemma. This is called dilemma in logic. What am I going to do? I have a dialogue. Should I go over this or should I pick this up? But I can't pick it up. I tried. I failed. He goes again. He goes, no, I'm not going to walk over the name of God. He goes to pick it up again. He falls again. He gets all muddy. He gets up the third time and he says, I know who's putting me down on the mud and I know who's testing me. But wallahi, if I fall a million times, I'm going to pick this up. I'm not going to go home. While he's drunk, he goes the third time, he pick it up. He goes home, he cleans it. And then he puts perfume on it. And then he put it in the highest place in his house and he falls asleep. He falls asleep and he has a dream. And he hears a voice in the dream. And the voice, the Hatif says, he says, you purified our name today from the mud and you perfumed it. And you put it in the highest place. O Bishop, we'll purify you. And we'll perfume your name. The people will mention you until the end of time with beauty. And then he wakes up. He abandons the alcohol. Because he had God on his side. He abandons the alcohol. And he becomes Bishop Hafi. He becomes a sheikh. Thousands and thousands of people... They came to Islam, practicing Islam, made toba at his hand. And up to today, 12th century later, we're still mentioning him here in Texas. We're mentioning Bishr al-Hafi, rahimahullah, may Allah have mercy on his soul. Why? Because he turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he knew that if I turn, Allah is not going to, he's not going to close his door. Allah will not close his doors. His doors are always open. This is what Mawlana Rumi, the thing that he said that really is one of the most beautiful lines. He said, In Dargahimo, Dargahi no Miji needs. The kingdom of God is not a kingdom of hopelessness. It's not a kingdom of hopelessness. And if you've broken your vows a thousand times, come back and come as you are. Come as you are. Don't filter yourself when you go to God. In this society, they want you to filter yourself in order to give you a like. Allah loves you unfiltered, the way you are. Go to Allah whenever, whatever time, anytime you're ready, just go to him. And his door is open and he's waiting for you to come and make tawbah and turn to him. And may Allah make us amongst the people that we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have a relationship with Allah and we have a relationship with our Prophet and we are people of Toba. In Alhamdulillah, in Ahmadu, when a stain on a suffer, when I would do Lahim in Shururi and Fusina, when we say Ati Amalina, Man Yahdihla, Fala Mudella, Man Yudle, Fala Hadila, Wa Ashadu Allah, Ilah in Allah, who are the Hula Sharikala, Wa Ashadu and Muhammad and Abduhu, Wara Sulu, who are Salahu, Bil Huda Bashir, and Munadir, and Kala Lahi Subhanahu, with the Alafi for Ani Majid, in Allah, who are the Hula Sharikala, 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 اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد انتب القلوب ودبائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبصار وضياها وقوت الأرواح وغذائها وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أرحم أمتي بأمتي أبو بكر وشدهم في أمر الله أمر وأستغفر محمد وثمان بكر
علي بن فاطمه سيده ونساء اهل الجنه وحسن وحسين سيده شباب اهل الجنه وحمزه اسد الله واسد الرسول خير القرون قرني ثم الذين يلونهم ثم الذين يلونهم ان الله يامر بالعدل والاحسان وايتاء القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروا لي اذكركم واشكروا لي ولا تكفرون وذكر الله اكبر واقيموا الصلاه